Hi everyone, thank you for joining me in today's talk. I am Yogesh. I'm a product leader in the artificial intelligence team at eBay, and I'm on a mission to uh, transform eBay, reimagine eBay using AI. Before we get started, first of all, I really hope that you and your families are keeping safe in this long pandemic winter. Um, okay, all right, let's get started. So we'll keep it today at very, very high level. We'll learn basics of what AI is, what are the, your AI use cases. Uh, we'll talk about the AI product lifecycle, who are the stakeholders that are involved, what are the responsibilities of a product manager, you know, skill sets that challenge they face, and how to become an AI first product manager. Right? I'm gonna use AI and machine learning interchangeably today. Um, not going to get into the philosophical debate about that. Uh, since we are using PowerPoint, according to man, we should be calling it AI. All right. Um, before we dive into the details of AI, I just want to share a story with you on how I got started, with how I got interested in AI. So once I was just you know looking around, playing with Google Photos. If you don't know Google Photos, Google Photos is a mobile application by Google. You can essentially store all your photos in there and you just don't have to think about, you know, organizing it, Google does it for you. You get any point of time, you can search and retrieve the photo that you're looking for using the keywords, right? For example, I was in this case uh, looking for pictures that had bridges in them. And I was looking for a picture that I took in the Golden Grid uh, Bridge in San Francisco. Uh, so I was uh, searching, the result showed up, sure, a lot of golden gate bridges, but this particular photo showed up. And I was really curious because uh, uh, this particular picture was taken uh, long back in Switzerland when in one of our hikes. And, you know, if, you're, if I didn't browse the photo manually, I think I will miss this photo because, you know, you have to like really stare at it and uh, you know, it's nuanced, right? Quite nuanced. So it's not very evident where the bridge is in the picture, but uh, Google Photos did a wonderful job, right? Of course, in the back end, they're using uh, remarkable artificial intelligence and, and computer vision techniques to do this. Uh, but this got me hooked, right? So I had to like figure out how this is working. And that's how I got really, really interested in artificial intelligence. I come from a software engineering and product management background. Uh, so essentially, I'm, I'm self-taught in, in AI. Um, okay. So in a typical software-based uh, product, the way how it works at, at the very high level, how it works is uh, there's someone, uh, typically a software developer, who figures out how to essentially write rules uh, for performing a particular task and write through in, in a software programming language, a code that a computer can essentially understand. And once this program is written, it uh, consumes certain data and, and produces a certain output, right? So very simple program plus data gives output. In AI, it's a fundamentally different paradigm, right? What happens is for AI-based system, what you do it, you give, the the data to an AI system, which is still learning, right? It starts learning, right? It's imagine that it's a very early phases. You provide data to it, you provide some sample outputs first, and it spits out some rules, right? So we don't really call that code, we call it models, AI models. So data plus output gives models. And it, it's a long process, right? You keep training, keep training, but lots and lots of data and outputs and produce models. Now, what you could do is that you can take this model and similar to programming, this model is, is the road, is the, is the code, right? You provide it some new data in production and it provides predictions or new outputs, right? So that is the very simple concept, right? You create the model, you give it more data and produce new output. Um, we'll go through an example to, and it, uh, then it will make a little bit more sense. Okay, so before we dive into the example and the details, uh, let's see, why do we care? Why do we care about AI? Um, 
according to McKinsey, AI and AI-based applications are going to unlock tremendous economic potential, right? So about $13 trillion by 2030, uh, which is going to be making up like 1.2% of the GDP per annum by 2030, right? Uh, just as a way of comparison, like how big this number is, uh, steam engine, uh, which is really one of the most transformational technology in humankind's history, right? It really gave birth to the industrial revolution. It added about 0.3% uh, to the GDP between 1850 and 1910, right? So that's how big AI is, right? So now, of course, some of these reports have to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, because, you know, we, you know, any new technology, we tend to be overly optimistic about it. Um, but nevertheless, right? So there are some early signs. Uh, because if you look carefully around, AI is literally everywhere. Uh, it, it touches even today every like single sector that you can imagine is is, is like using AI, right? So you start with entertainment. Uh, you I think you probably all watch Netflix, right? Binge watch on Netflix. Uh, typically, when you watch uh, any programs, it's the AI underneath that actually recommending you what you may or may not like, right? And typically you end up like choosing one of the programs there, right? You don't really search too much on Netflix uh, for the stuff that you're looking for. You, it, it recommends you stuff, right? On social media, for example, TikTok. TikTok not only recommends you, it's a mobile app if you have not never used it. TikTok, essentially it's like uh, very short videos, right? You keep scrolling through it, you watch a video, it generates another video. Um, it's not only recommending, of next video to watch to a user, it actually helps uh, the users during the content creation itself, right? So it, it helps the users to create a video um, in, a, in a way that it might be, you know, more uh, like potentially it will get more uh, likes and it may get wired, right? Consumer electronics, right? So think of Eco Dot, Siri, you know, on your mobile phones, these voice assistants, which are great, by the way, I use them all the time. Especially when I'm driving, uh, you know, you want to put up any any songs, and you just talk to talk to these devices, right? That's AI. Uh, any major websites that you will see, uh, any kind of customer support, uh, chatbots. You know, typically earlier you used to like call in to customer support. Now you would just chat, uh, and typically a bot is handling a lot of questions, right? So think think about you know how efficient it would be, right? Instead of having uh, 10,000 uh, different customer support agents, you could just deploy a bot, right? I'm not saying that they can probably today replace completely the humans, but it sort of augments and enhances the customer experience, right? Uh, and so these are where some of the examples in, you know, uh, web-based application and consumer electronics, right? But it's really like in the physical realm also, AI is making a lot, right? So Self-driving car has been, you know, long, sort long after, and it has been, you know, sort of that unachievable dream, dream but now it's coming closer to the reality. You know, Waymo and other companies are not quite close and they have driven literally millions of miles without, without a driver, right? And using AI uh, to do the, the self-driving, right? Agriculture, it's a very important uh, sector. You know, uh, at the rate our population is growing, uh, we will not have enough food, right, according to certain projections. So it's important to be very efficient in, in utilizing our scarce land and water resources. And today, like AI is being used to uh, to figure out how to efficiently use pesticides and weeds and, and water the plants according to weathers and stuff like that, right? Um, trading, high frequency trading is extremely important. It uses, uh, you know, AI algorithms. There is actually uh, I think I forgot the name, but there is an uh, ETF, exchange rate of funds, that is driven entirely uh, through AI. What it is doing is it's taking around a lot of macro signals and it is like buying and selling uh, based on those macro re results, macro uh, trends. And essentially, uh, the founders of this company have created an ETF and it's publicly uh, traded on a New York Stock Exchange. Uh, look it up, right? You will find it easily, right? I think they have a billion dollar under management already. Fraud detection in banking uh, is extremely uh, sensitive area and increasingly uh, AI is being used to automatically detect frauds, right? And it's fraud detection is 
it's almost like a cat and mouse game, right? So you try to block certain uh, certain levels of fraud, and uh, and the bad actors will find way to circumvent uh, the fraud, right? And find new ways to create fraud, right? Uh, so AI in here uh, is extremely sensitive and extremely um, you know uh, fast to adapt to new ways of fraud. Um, healthcare uh, AI is increasingly helping doctors to diagnose some of the deadly diseases quite early like stroke uh, heart diseases etc based on you know different uh, different like signs vital signs of, of human body uh, gaming this is a very interesting year i think the name is or fear it's a it's a shooting kind of game what's interesting is that we have always played games with you know what we call like a you know, programmed opponent computer opponent right in this particular game, uh, if you're not playing with others, it could also be a multiplayer game. But if you're not playing with others, you're playing just with, with the, the game itself, the program. Uh, it has an AI-powered opponent. And what it does is that it's learning constantly uh, with the user. So if it makes a mistake, you beat this opponent, uh, it will learn slowly and it will avoid those mistakes, right? And it will be getting better and better, similar to a human a uh, human uh, person, right? It's gonna be, you can imagine it's gonna be super fun, right? And I think we have all like seen in in the articles, these articles, there was this game called AlphaGo, right? So this Go is a very popular game, strategic game, and AI was able to be the best uh, player in, in Go in the world. Uh, so it's pretty exciting, it's insane. Uh, and it's very, very cool, right? And this is today, right? Uh, just imagine, you know, humans are um, not very good at, uh, imagining the future, uh, you know, state of the technology, but typically uh, it's exponential curve. It's not just linear, right? So even 10 years from now, uh, you can try to imagine uh, how, how relevant AI is gonna be, right? And all of a sudden the McKinsey report, it talks about $13 trillion, does not seem to be very far-fetched. All right, so what we'll do now is we will talk about, uh, we'll take a small, simple example, uh, spam filter, right? Uh, build a AI powered spam detection service, right? So what we'll do is we will uh, take this example through the product development life cycle. Uh, we will see what are, who are the stakeholders and what are they doing uh, during the AI product development life cycle, right? So for a product manager, it's very important to understand these stakeholders so that whenever uh, they are, uh, you know, achieving, trying to achieve a goal, build an AI application, uh, they can keep everyone uh, sort of aligned. All right. Uh, so at the start of it, typically there's a business stakeholder that uh, that uh, defines a business problem, and typically the, in a you know, an organization that would be a product manager, or at least product manager is working on the behalf of a business stakeholder. Right. Uh, so let's take a simple example: spam detection service, and. Uh, um, so it's how, what it is. If you have used any uh, email service like Gmail and Outlook, you would uh, instantly recognize. You will also recognize the need for it because we all get a lot of emails and quite a few of them could be spam uh, emails, right? And in this day and age, we hardly have time to clear our inbox. We don't want our inbox to be like, you know, full of spam, right? So what we'll do is that um, we'll build a service that takes the spam whenever you receive an email, checks whether it is a spam or not. And if it is spam, puts it in the spam folder. Otherwise, uh, that email goes to inbox, right? Pretty simple. It's it's called in terms in AI speak, it's called uh, a binary classifier. Why binary? Because there are two classes, spam or no spam. All right. So uh, problem is clearly defined. It's in simple English, right? It's well understood. Huh? Uh, in AI, apart from defining problem statement, there is another thing that we have to be very, very sure of is the constraints and metrics around what is a success look like, right? I'm not saying in success in terms of like, the number of spam uh, blocked per user or something like that, but it's more in terms of AI model itself. Right? Of course, business metrics are also important to define, but specifically, what does this metric on AI look like, right? So very simple example. Imagine that you get an important email and it gets moved to the spam folder. And 
think about it. I feel like it's very important. Like imagine you you were waiting for an email from a recruiter that that is you know gonna inform you about your your next step, interview steps, right? You don't want to miss this email. You don't want it to be classified as spam, right? So any spam detection service should not have false positives or at least minim- try to minimize it. Meaning it should not falsely identify an email as spam and put it in spam folder, right? So as a product manager, you have to be very sensitive. You have to define that we are optimizing to minimize the false positive or, or in other terms, like very high uh, precision, right? Um, this changes from problem to problem, right? If you just take up another example, let's say medical diagnosis, right? Um, in medical diagnosis, if you falsely uh, figure out that a patient uh, has a disease, right? In the worst case, what they could do is that they can do further tests. And uh, then maybe if there was a false positive, they can always, you know, the ne- next set of tests uh, can al- always reveal, right? Even uh, that they don't have the disease, right? Even during COVID times, we have seen uh, some people get false positive. They are identified as positive, or COVID positive. They take another test and they, it turns out to be negative, right? So in this particular case, false positives are okay. What we don't want to do is not to miss out any chance, right? So imagine someone has a like a critical fatal kind of disease and you want to detect it early so that you can take precaution or some, some early uh, medications. What you want to do is you want to minimize the miss rate. You do not want to miss even like a, with the slightest iota chance that if person had a disease, uh, you want to detect it, right? So false positives are okay here, false negatives are not okay, right? So it really depends on, on problem to problem. Okay, so uh, product manager, once they have defined these constraints, they have uh, defined the problem, they will work with data analysts. Sometimes data analysts uh, and data scientists are uh, the same. What data analysts are trying to do is they are trying to um, acquire all the data that is needed in order to train the model, right? So remember, uh, uh, a model has to be trained over data, right? So what they're doing is that they are just look at the example, right? This particular email, you know, buy now, free, don't don't miss. This kind of emails typically looks like a spam, right? And as non-spam uh, email would be typically like someone from your contact. They are writing to you about, you know, doing something together, uh, planning something, right? Uh, so one or two examples is not enough, right? Just to give you a sense. Uh, typically, building this kind of uh, AI service requires maybe 100,000 emails that are spam and 100,000 emails that are non spam, right? So, what a data analyst will try to do is they will try to acquire this data, and it could be internal also. Like, if you are, have a service like Gmail, you can imagine you may have 100 million or even a billion users, you have a lot of email, and it's not that difficult to you know get the data set, right? So, you get the data set, but raw data set, but you have to also uh, sort of label them, right? Uh, each uh, each spam mail has to be labeled so. Like it is a spam, you have to market it as spam and non like spam email, you have to market non spam, right? So typically, there are third party vendors uh, you can crowdsource also uh, who who you can provide your raw data set and they will give you a labeled data set back. Uh, in case you do not have this data yet, uh, you can actually use some of the public data sets that are available, but you can actually buy you know, data from third party vendors depending upon different verticals and sectors. Also, that's also possible there. Um, so keep this in mind, acquiring the data is fundamental, right? If you don't have the data, you cannot build AI algorithms, right? So they, they need data to be trained. Um, once the problem is clear, the data has been acquired, uh, data, data scientists, what they will do is they do that they explore the data, uh, they have to prepare it, they, they study it, for example, uh, in this exploration, they're trying to figure out, okay, what is what are the characteristics of, of spam email, right? So if you can see, for example, they tend to mention quite a bit the words free, money, and these kind of things, right? So they do this, uh, this kind of preliminary analysis, they will um transform the data sometimes you know there are some some words for example 
the in these are a few filler words they will remove it right they don't do not contribute anything towards the ai right so they will try to prepare the data set such that um the only the ones that could be useful in making a decision spam versus non spam are remaining right and what they will do is typically they will split the data in in different sets one set it will be used for training uh the model and once the model is you know they perform data scientists performs a lot of experiments it explore different uh, ai architectures and it's a it's a iterative process it's a trial and error process it's not like you cannot build it in like a one go and typically it could take weeks also uh, sometimes less and after a lot of experiments they come to a model that is uh, that uh, they think is performing good they will have some certain performance metrics and they will test it against the validation data set that they have remember they have split the data so once they are doing it then they can typically show that model is like increasingly getting better and better and better and they will have like for example 99% precision that model is able to tell between spam and non spam right so um uh, once it is ready when the once the model is ready typically they will go and form um you know they work with the stakeholders and they all look at this uh the, the model output and if there are like any feedback they can just go back and retrain the model or they can together decide that it's ready uh, to be put into production right so once uh, the model is ready uh, typically an ml engineer or data engineer they will get involved uh, but remember because right now we are in an experiment lab right we have a model that is a sort of a release candidate or production candidate right but imagine that the model has to be put in production where literally like hundreds of millions of users might be using it right so you have to ensure that the model itself is wrapped into a service with an api and it is able to scale horizontally with you know so many users and there might also typically be some kind of a latency requirement as you can imagine anyone gets uh, an email it has to be immediately classified between in, in going to inbox versus a spam folder you not wait like for example 30 minutes right uh, to do that so so production is it's a lot of hard work uh, you also have to like make build data pipelines so that you know uh, uh, the email data is reliably coming to the model and there's no, essentially no downtime right these models once in put in production you have to make sure it's always up uh, because you are building for a service essentially like uh, uh, like gmail which probably is like 99.9999 percent available right so it's a lot of um, engineering involved it's not very not super different from traditional software engineering production but apart from the fact that uh, you also have to take into account uh, the model related uh, pipeline itself and and essentially the model itself could also uh, degrade in time you know what we call it drift uh, meaning that you put out the model in there it's working for a while well after one month you will see that model is not yet uh, not uh, uh, any more effect as effective as before right so imagine precision was 99% now it is doing less it's 90% precise only or even 80% and it's getting less effective in telling between spam versus non spam right so you have to keep monitoring this and it could happen for a lot of reasons um the you know the the, the nature of spam might have changed or some pipeline might have broken and you're not getting the right side of data to to predict this kind of thing can happen right so proper monitoring has to be done and if necessary the model has to be retrained right in certain cases actually the model is being trained constantly with new data new things right imagine the the concept of spam itself is changing over a period of time so you have to make sure that this model has to be effective so you keep it training regularly um so apart from the ml engineer who's putting the model in production they work closely with application developers sometimes they could be same person uh but application developer are more focused on gmail service let's say right so they will integrate the model which has an api into their core uh, software application and sometimes they will have to also explain the model uh, output i'll give you an example um, imagine there is you're using uh, yeah, redfin redfin is a if you for those who don't know it's a site that is dedicated for real estate in in the us essentially if you are buyer or seller of uh, homes or home property 
uh, you can use this to search properties uh, and, and you can visit them and, and you can look at the pricing and all this information, right? So what Traction does, they have a product where they can estimate the selling price of a house before it is sold, right? And they do it with a lot of factors. And, but like, if you click somewhere, you, you can actually get some explanation. If they tell you that this is the price, they will tell you breakdown. Why is this? Maybe it's because it's closer to a good school uh, or it's because it's month of May and typically people move, buy more houses in, in May versus December, right? Or, or things of that sort, right? So they will explain you, right? So it is very important. Explanative is very important because, uh, you know, sometimes AI could be a black box thing and there's not a lot of trust. So every single time there's AI model involved, it's always a good, good idea to have some kind of explanative built in. Sometimes for uh, compliance, regulatory compliance reasons also, ethical reasons also, uh, but always a good idea to have explainability. Lastly, end users who are consuming uh, the AI application, uh, they are very important also in the product development lifecycle because they could be giving you some very useful signals and feedback, which help you to make your models more effective to improve it, right? For example, um, Suppose I use this again, coming back to the spam example. Suppose the user by mistake, the model is not performing good enough. The, mod, the email, which was not spam, it goes to the spam folder. And typically sometimes, you know, if you're expecting some email, you go to the spam folder to check. And if you find it there, you will mark it as non-spam. So here is an example of an email that was misqualified but the user by taking an action, by moving between box, they give you useful feedback, right? You can incorporate that and you can like have a look on why this particular email was misqualified and take that feedback back in so that model could be better. And in the future, those kind of mistakes will not happen. All right, so we went through the product development life cycle. As a product manager, it's also important to keep uh, you know, abreast of the latest and latest AI trends. So the example we went through was a very basic example. Uh, there is a lot of manual work steps involved, involved as you can see, but the tools for building AI applications are getting increasingly more sophisticated, more automated, right? In fact, some of the simple examples that the examples that I showed you is a simple binary classifier. Those kind of applications or AI models can be built almost automatically today using like what we call AutoML. All the major cloud vendors uh, offering AI tools, they offer AutoML. Uh, in, in fact, you can see that today even uh, high school kids are using AI uh, in their science projects, right? So this is like how good the tools are becoming, right? But like increasingly also inside, uh, there's some simple, uh, problems are solved using these automated tools and they are like put into production today. Right? Um, so we saw the example where AI is, you know, helping to, uh, to make these predictions. And if you do it over a very large scale, imagine like how long will it take for you to scan billions of emails manually, right? So AI automated all this, right? So you can automate using software, but in software engineering, you cannot really define like every single case of how a spam might or might not be, right? So AI is automating those kind of a cognitive tasks uh, quite well, right? But increasingly AI is becoming also creative, right? So we tend to associate creativity with humans, uh, humans and intelligence, right? Um, but increasingly AI is, you know, generating really like original content, right? So in this particular case, uh, you're seeing that you just describe um, what you're trying to build, you're trying to build a simple web page. And this AI essentially writes uh, code, JavaScript code and or HTML code to build this like simple website, right? So it's very primitive for now, right? But think about it, right? What happened was an AI essentially uh, parsed the language, understood it, understood the intent and generated the code automatically, right? So this is remarkable. In another example, if you've seen a movie called Inception, uh, Christopher Nolan, I think, uh, here that movie was about the like, going in dream inside a dream kind of thing, right? Here, an AI is using 
uh, and there is a technique called like uh, there's a framework called GPT uh, three. What it is doing is it's using AI to create an AI model to build classification. And this is like multi-class classifier, image-based five classes, right? So it's already more difficult problem than what we just like covered, this spam detection, right? So uh, AI creating AI, right? You could imagine that this is an inception moment or Skynet moment of Terminator, right? Um, I don't want to like, uh, you know, paint a, you know, scary picture. Uh, but I think it's very, very interesting. It's very exciting. Yeah, a lot of good things can be done with this. Uh, in this particular example, uh, these two uh, faces, they look so real, right? They are not they are not real persons, right? So in this particular example, AI was shown a lot of uh, images of celebrities and asked to generate a new image, entirely new image that look like celebrity. So AI algorithm picked up different factors of how a celebrity might look like and generated this very, very original looking thing, right? We have all seen the fake content, fake videos, and deep fakes, right? So, like any tools, there are positive things that you could do with it, and negative things is also right. Uh, but here in this talk, we have this neutral, right? We're just talking about you know, creating hopefully good things, right? Uh, this one example is is amazing example actually. So this is a music that was created by AI, right? So uh, I think they are. Uh, not heard particularly this artist, Alan Jackson, apparently country music. Uh, but this AI like listened to the songs and generated a similar sounding song, right? It's pretty amazing. I'll just play it. Yeah, right. So I think even the words or the lyrics of the songs were also automatically generated. It's really, really amazing. Uh, check it out. I think you can search for it. Um, the point is, uh, AI is evolving rapidly and it's getting amazing. The, the possibilities are immense, right? So as a AI PM, you have to be able to follow these trends and you know, wrap your head, first of all, wrap your head around this and just, just imagine the possibilities, right? whatever business you might be in, and don't think incrementally, think think um, radical innovation, right? So think about your mission statement of your company and just how differently you can achieve, right? Uh, if you're doing it right, it can be a huge, huge uh, competitive differentiation. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's switch gears. Let's talk about what kind of skill set is needed for an AI product manager. So we have all seen this kind of typical uh, Venn diagram, right? Um, so a yeah, product manager is at an intersection between business user experience and software development typically, right? So as we have seen, we'll add data science to this. Um, and with this, we cover you know, their different skill sets. So you don't have to be a data scientist, but you have to be able to understand what they're doing, being able to talk to them, explain to them, um, the business problem in the language they could understand, right? So uh, that's uh, that's pretty important. Uh, we have already seen that it's super important to have you know the knowledge of latest industry trends, uh, but not only you don't have to like always do secondary research, right? Because you will have if you're building AI yeah, seriously, you will have experts, right? And they will for sure keep a very close on eye. And if you don't understand something, don't be afraid to go and talk to them, ask them. Uh, learn from them and they will tell you, you know, what technologies are mature and what technologies are you know, still quite uh, early in the game, right? So, so that you don't get carried away, right? Um, one thing I would say is that it is um, super important to define the business problems and in fact, to find the right problems to solve, right? So what ha would happen is that AI uh, could also be a little bit hyped and what happens is that if you talk, talk to senior business stakeholders, right, what they would expect you is uh, some kind of magic, right, in, in two weeks. But uh, AI is nothing but it's like it requires a lot of hard work, right? So there's no magic involved at all. Even though some of the tools have gotten better, 
it is still a lot of hard work, especially to put something in production, right? If you're not just doing a proof of concept uh, kind of project, if you're doing like real uh, in production, it is a lot of hard work, right? So, and sometimes it takes more resources than it is needed um, for a software development project. As you can see, the number of stakeholders has just expanded, right? And then like getting the data is also not that easy. It could be cost prohibitive also, right? But it's super important to pick up the right problems uh, maybe break it down. If you're very early in the game, break it down into small problems and just focus on quick wins, early wins. Pick up a problem that hopefully is not a five-year project. At the same time, it creates a meaningful impact, right? Anywhere in any function and in any area of the business, it creates a meaningful uh, impact so that you can, you know, Get more resources, build more projects, and things like that. Right? Don't don't get like overexcited. And if you have nothing, you're starting from scratch in your in your company, then uh, don't invest like thirty million dollars, fifty million dollars in the AI project. Right? Just start small. Right? And with today's tools, it is uh, possible to just do it with like you know three or four folks working on a good small project, uh, high impact. Right? Uh, when you acquire the data, data acquisition is very, very uh, important. And think about data strategically, not tactically. Meaning, for your particular project, yeah, okay, you need to get a particular set of data, right? But it doesn't stop there, right? So it's you're not acquiring data for pro on a project by project basis. You're actually data acquisition is a sound overarching uh, strategy. So what happens is that when you get the data uh, and you incorporate AI to your product, right? So your product can get a little bit better, right? It, it can wow your users. Uh, so think of it as a spy, taking Gmail example, for example, right? So initially they did not monetize the product. I think Gmail still is not monetized, at least in not consumer world, right? So they offered it for free, but they got a lot of users. And with a lot of users, they got a lot of data. Taking again, going back to the spam example, they have a lot of data about the spams, right? So they acquired this data. They built amazing spam detection service around it and a lot of bunch of other applications as well, right? So the Gmail service got really good, right? What happens is that once you have a good product, you can acquire more users and more importantly, whatever users you've acquired, you can retain them. You keep offering them more and more value, right? So it sort of generates this positive flywheel effect, right? Think about data acquisition strategy as like what products could you could build so that you will acquire more data to build more amazing products. So think in, in those terms. And lastly, uh, communication uh, with your stakeholders uh, is super important, uh, but outside also, right? You have to be uh, able to explain this complex ethical and legal uh, uh, issues that may occur with AI, right? Uh, we have all seen the examples of certain AI uh, you know, a chatbot that was launched, I think, by Microsoft, if I'm not mistaken, it started to learn some you know, slurs, right? Um, but it need not be as dramatic. I think, like, I'll give you another example. Imagine you are building an AI application to screen, you know, hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, resumes that you're receiving, your organization is receiving, right? You want to screen them and find out the right candidates, right? Imagine you build an AI model to screen the candidates. Now, Think what happens, right? Yeah, what could happen is that you have built this over real world data, right? And imagine you find out that your screener AI model is, um, you know, disproportionately filtering out certain minorities uh, or certain like you know, women, right? Uh, it, it is extremely sensitive, right? So these kind of biases may creep into your AI model because they are using real world data, right? So it's super important to be very cognizant of this. Uh, it's again like putting the model into production is, is involves a lot of work, including uh, doing this kind of analysis or, and actively looking for biases. Right? That's why explainability is super important. Um, all right. And um, now, what kind of companies should you be looking for if you want to really, if you're super interested in building these AI applications, right? So I would say a lot of companies are building AI applications. Some of them are you know, still early. They are taking, trying to understand AI better. Uh, they, but there could be companies that apply AI sort of incrementally to their core businesses, right? And just sort of plugging AI into an already existing processes, right? 
but i would say ai first companies think about it differently for them uh companies core product essentially as are based on ai uh, we talked a lot about uh, gmail and all right so google definitely is, uh, is one of them um, i i leave you to your homework on what the other companies are uh, ebay is definitely one of them because today we cannot imagine ebay without ai if you take out ai a lot of thing will break down right about product search recommendations uh filtering out um, is a counterfeit items on the uh, on the marketplace things like that right so um so you if you want to be there there's a lot of companies who focus and who are actively building ai based products to so for those companies those companies typically as i mentioned data is treated as first class citizen and not only data is being acquired it is being acquired uh intentionally like we said setting about the positive flywheel right and not only it's been acquired it is been kept retained and in a format it could be readily shared across the company uh and build like different kind of ai applications right and not only uh, uh people are building ai applications in fact their processes culture everything is is around ai right uh people would live and breathe right so not not everyone would be an expert but you know no one would say like if you can go to someone and talk about solving using ai some problem right they they would not tell you that this is not going to work or uh, they'll look at you as if <laughs> you're not making any sense right so people process everything should be like around ai right and there are a lot of companies out there uh, who are like this right um and if you're just starting out if you're new to ai i know we covered uh, a uh, lot of things here uh, i think the recording will be shared i will look uh, watch it again but there are like certainly a lot of good resources out there uh, andrew ng is one of the pioneers of ai uh, he's a co-founder of corsair i think start i also started the uh, google brain project said google um he, he is amazing amazing teacher right so i saw AI for everyone in one course era. You can watch; it's amazing teacher. Um, but what I would say also that there are other resources. I gave some of the technical resources on AWS. So there are resources for all kinds of skill levels. Uh, what I would recommend is um, take an example and actually like the spam example that we covered, right? Take it and you can actually go through this process. I uh, guide the guided uh, guided learning labs out there. you can actually build ai uh, models yourself like initially what will happen is that you, you get understand a little bit more and also you won't be like afraid of it any anymore right you won't be afraid of talking to data scientists so it's it's quite important to experience it yourself right and it's not that complex if you know a little bit of python today or know a little bit of data i think if you know how to use a spreadsheet you can build an ai model today, right um so those are the resources uh, you can use uh hopefully this recording and the deck will be shared uh all right thank you so much for joining me today i hope uh you learned something uh, probably i learned something also by explaining helping to explain some of this concept and making this this material i would also like to thank product school for giving me this opportunity to reach out to a lot of folks interested folks who could benefit from this uh feel free to connect me on linkedin uh mike soni um and also like feel free i think this recording will be posted uh feel free to add comments in there provide me feedback i will come back uh you know incorporate your uh, feedback and hopefully make uh more content like whatever area you want me to touch upon i will uh, probably deep dive into some of those concepts as well um i'm also hiring an ai product manager actively so if you think uh, you have the skill set you are super interested reach out to me uh share one uh, share the news and thank you so much i hope you enjoyed the session and until next time thank you bye bye for now